Well, good morning and welcome to the Atlantic Council, both those in person and those virtually. I'm Landon Darrance. I am the Senior Director of the Atlantic Council Global Energy Center and uh, the Morning Star Chair for Global Energy Security. Uh, very excited for a conversation today uh, with Akshat Rathi on the compatibility of meaningful climate action and economic growth, a conversation inspired by his recently published book, Climate Capitalism, Winning the Race to Zero Emissions and Solving the Crisis of Our Age. Here in Washington, D.C., and, and frankly around the world, uh, climate change remains a hot-button issue. It can be polarizing, discussions around financial risk of the energy transition, the cost of decarbonization, uh, the free market and the role of it. You know what's not polarizing? Frankly, it's uh, financial success and competitiveness. But what if we could do both as individuals, corporations, governments, thinking through how we can max maximize our economic prosperity and our climate action? And that's a, a great conversation and one that we're really excited to have here. Uh, you know, at the Atlantic Council, we don't always think of achieving our net zero aims, our climate action, as a linear pathway. Uh, there's global energy security risk, there is uh, economic prosperity issues that we need to tackle. And if we could get those right as well, a lot of times we can accelerate the pathway to achieve net zero and uh, in our climate goals. It's, it's indicative of why we engage in, in efforts, for example, in COP28 around the global decarbonization accelerator, uh, and why we want to mature that conversation as we look to Baku and COP29 around the financial aspects of that exact same conversation. Uh, in his book, uh, Akshat uses uh, illustrations of in conversations around pathways for oil and gas giants to transform their com companies along with energy transition, opportunities to maximize the, oppor uh, the, uh, the profitability and climate action of the global south. Uh, these are uh, just examples and illustrations of how our economic system is compatible with climate action. So I'm excited for today's conversation. It comes at a great time as we're on the cusp of the World Bank meetings and spring meetings here in Washington, D.C., where a lot of these conversations will be vibrantly debated. And, uh, and with that, uh, it's my pleasure to turn the uh, conversation over to our moderator for the day, uh, Neela Banerjee, who's the chief climate editor of NPR, uh, to get the conversation going. Uh, welcome, Akshat and Neela. Thank you. Thanks. I appreciate it. Welcome, everybody. It's great to have you join us today for um, a conversation about an interesting and important book. Um, and so, um, I, I, you know, I wanted to. I, I read your work at Bloomberg. I'm familiar with it, and that's one of the reasons I agreed to to moderate this because it's good to talk to you about it. And and as you know from your work at Bloomberg, and we know at NPR, that there's so many ways to get to the issues around climate change. There's so many issues that climate change uh, delivers. And so I wanted to ask you, like, what prompted you to write a book about climate change and capitalism? Yeah, it was about uh, 2017, 18, 19, when I was uh, getting into climate journalism. And I came to it from a lens of trying to figure out, is the world doing enough? Are there solutions around the world that are starting to work? Because the perception, at least from a public side, was that even though finally the Paris Agreement, where all countries came together and set some targets, there was no real action happening, that there was no emissions reduction happening. We were setting new greenhouse gas emissions records. And I wanted to test whether that is really the case. And what I found was everywhere there were either shoots of solutions uh, being deployed, or in some places, things working at real big scale, where huge number of companies were involved, big amount of private capital was involved, but all of it was being shaped by government policy. And so finally, we were starting to see an economic system that was trying to address this problem rather than just sit beside or, or make the problem worse. So um, for those people who have not read the book yet, um, and and it is, uh, you know, it's it's, it's an easy read because each chapter is has concrete people and institutions and or and 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 events that you can you know you can follow along with. Um, what would you what would you say are the central ideas that yeah. you're exploring in the book? So um, I come from a background of science. That's uh, that's my training. And so first I looked at technologies, and there are a whole host of technologies that are now working at scale. Uh, so we know about solar, wind, batteries, and electric cars. But I wanted to find stories where there are sort of unusual places where you wouldn't typically expect those things to happen. 
you know, on the internet as, as climate reporters or editors, we get this question. But look, it's India and China building all the coal power plants. Mm -hmm. It's not us Europeans or Americans who are the problem. And turns out, in those very places, climate solutions are perhaps, in the case of China at least, scaling even faster. So I wanted to look at where these technologies are scaling. That was one, one idea. But as I started reporting these stories out, the other thing that became very clear to me was that there are all these systemic levers that need to be pulled to enable these technologies to actually work. Uh, and these are climate laws, these are policies, these are financial institutions, even activism either at a shareholder level or uh, protests. Uh, all of those support and make the change possible. So the book ended up becoming a series of case studies looking at where these things are almost working and uh, who are the people behind them and how this combination of bringing people, policy, and technology typically unlocks uh, an emissions reduction pathway. Yeah, it, it was interesting because in the book you mentioned that you know you're you're looking at different kinds of capitalism. I mean, you visit India, you visit Denmark, you visit uh, um, the United States, uh, China. Certainly, you spent a lot of time in, and um, and and this this combination of tech policy and people. But what, when I was reading all of this, what really struck me is that for people who have ideas about tech and then for the tech itself to flourish, right? You do need these policies. And so given the diversity of the, the economic and political systems uh, that, that your chapters are based in, are there any major takeaways that are applicable to most economies that are driven uh, you know that that have a form of capitalism. I mean, I, I know it's a big ask, but yeah. I mean, are, like when you like when you think back to it, you know, what are the lessons that, or what are the commonalities that you saw? Yeah, I mean, one way to look at it is capitalism. You know, at its core, is private ownership uh, and profit-driven motive, right? Uh, but how it operates in these regions is quite different. Uh, that you know. American form of capitalism where you look at, uh, you know, it's a lot more free market than in other parts of the world, um, but also a political landscape on climate that's completely divided across two parties, one that wants to do something about it, the other that doesn't. And so the, the consensus that you can get, if there is one, is the Inflation Reduction Act, which is a huge amount of subsidies being given to companies to make greener products or greener technologies cheaper. Uh, in Europe, you get a different form because there is, even despite some right-wing parties coming to power in certain countries, a uh, political consensus that exists on climate action. And because of the structure of the EU, it isn't able to master its own financial capabilities and quite drive the level of subsidies that the US can give. Mm -hmm. But because of the political consensus, it's able to create a much more di directed uh, way of running its economy. So there are more uh, regulations coming on uh, on green policies, more clarity coming on what counts as an investment towards mm -hmm. green uh, technologies. In China, because it's a one-party rule, uh, it's a much more state-driven capitalism. You get much longer-term uh, policy making. So the electric car story that I try and uh, tell in this uh, in the book is a two-decade story. Right. Where the first decade it's almost secretive, and it's happening in the in people don't really notice, and uh, you know Beijing is filling up with smog, and suddenly the next decade. They've been built an entire industry with tens of billions of dollars in government subsidies, but also lots of rules to try and drive the market to create, um, to make Chinese people buy electric cars instead of fossil fuel cars. And so there are different forms of capitalism depending on the political and economic context. And what I wanted to show is there isn't one solution, but there are, there are these elements that you can use to build a framework for how it might work. Uh, just to follow up on that, it, it seems like, you know, the United States with the Inflation Reduction Act was probably the last, you know. I mean, India is kind of a special case, but um, but like if, if you're looking at, at big polluters like China, EU, United States, it's probably the last to come up with an ambitious climate plan. Do you feel like the Biden administration and Congress like looked at industrial policy in the rest of the world and said, given our context, especially Supreme Court, that makes it hard to have sticks to to um, to push industry to do things, like these are the kinds of carrots we can offer? Uh, certainly so. If anything, China itself took a, a leaf from the US playbook. Oh, yeah? So 
the electric vehicle story there, which is driven by this new energy vehicle policy, yeah. uh, is a modified version of the California zero emissions vehicle mandate. Hmm. Um, and so the US has a history of doing industrial policy over the past century. Um, and what the Biden administration saw is that now countries like China are taking it, applying it nationwide. So you don't just get a California in China, you get the entire country moving towards a new technology. Why not apply that nationwide in the US? Now it's a competitive game to be played, as uh, Landon was talking about, that this move towards trying to build green technologies isn't simply about greenhouse gas emissions. It's about financial uh, success and global competitiveness. Yeah, yeah, it absolutely is. So I wanted to um, ask you to, to kind of um, talk about one of the examples that you have in your book, and it is uh, a small, I guess, oil company at, at one point, the Danish oil company, that I think a lot of us now know as Orsted, which is like a big wind developer. And so can you tell us a little bit about Orsted's history and, and what the state of Denmark did to, to help its transition to uh, renewable energy. Yeah, to me it's been a fascinating story to watch because as climate reporters, sort of Orsted gets mentioned every All so the time. often. Because over this 2010, decade of 2010, it went from being Danish oil and natural gas to Orsted being, you know, 95% a fossil fuel company to being 80% a renewables company in just a decade's period. And everybody wants to be able to transform an oil and gas company to do clean energy, mm -hmm. of course. Uh, and so it's part of business case studies, et cetera. It's been written about plenty. But the story I found is much more complicated and much more nuanced because the story actually goes back 50 years. Uh, Danish oil and natural gas was created after the oil crisis in the 1970s. Uh, and uh, it was essentially used as a government instrument because it was uh, majority state owned uh, uh, throughout its life, even today. And the government used it as uh, its own instrument to try and use an experiment with policy. So first go out and find oil and gas in the North Sea rather than depend on Middle Eastern imports. Second, try and reduce the uh, amount of energy used for the same amount of use that you can get out of it. So it got into uh, gas pipelines, but also district heating. Eventually, when the European Union started to open up its market uh, for energy across borders, across European countries, the Danish government said, well, we need a national champion, just like Germany has RWE or mm -hmm. Sweden has Vattenfall. And so it went out and bought all these electricity utilities, coal power plants, offshore wind uh, turbines, which were being experimented in the 90s. And then in the 2000s and, and 2010s, climate change become, became a big reality for European Union, but also Denmark. And so climate laws were brought in, a carbon price was brought in, and suddenly the business case for what or was Dong was doing, the mm. initial oil and natural gas, wasn't any more feasible for its future. And so it pivoted to what was the one thing it had experimented with, which was offshore wind. Uh, and again, fortunate timing to some extent, other countries also wanted access to offshore wind. The UK was a big supporter in huge amount of subsidies, um, and Austin won big, big contracts, which enabled it to become what it has. But I mean, one of the interesting things, that there's another oil company that you write about, and that's Occidental, um, you know, based in, um, well, I mean, it's based in the United States, but it's got a big project going on in Texas. And, it, and it's, a, it's a different approach than Orsted. So for, for people who aren't familiar with Oxy, um, they, um, they've decided to invest big in direct air capture, which involves technology that, that sucks carbon dioxide out of the air and then injects it deep underground to store it. Um, this is a kind of technology that um, many climate experts and scientists believe is, is necessary, given how far we've, we've gotten with you know, uh, concentrations of greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere. Things are just so, um, things are just getting, you know, greenhouse gas emissions are still going up, and so lots of approaches need to be deployed to reduce emissions, including something that sounds very gee whiz and science fiction. So, um, so can you tell us a little bit about what Occidental is doing? Because it is it is not making that transition to renewable energy, no, right? It's it thinking about a different kind of oil that it wants to sell. Yeah, and maybe a little bit of context here before we get into the, the get into what Oxy is doing. Right. Um, we're talking about oil and gas companies. Uh, 
because those are probably the hardest big corporate capitalist uh, structures that need to be transformed for clean energy. Um, much of my work was informed by your work, Neela, looking at how oil companies had, you know, over decades known about climate change, known about climate science, but used that knowledge and then sowed disinformation, misinformation to try and slow down climate action. What you're, what you're seeing now, at least in 2010 and onwards, is that the reality of climate change and climate impacts has set in. You know, it is very much a business case now to figure out how you can be a part of the transition, um, even as you are in the short term going to make profits from oil and gas uh, production, uh, which is still required because the world is consuming oil and, oil and gas. Um, what Oxy and Vicky Holub, who's the CEO of Oxy, is making the bet on is that oil and gas companies aren't always good at doing clean energy. You know, Orsted is sort of an exception to the norm. They are not, uh, they are good at building big projects, but they have not done clean energy, so a different kind of uh, big projects. Instead, it knows how to handle ma massive amounts of fluids uh, and pipe them around the world uh, and dig deep and find them either underground or put them back underground. So Oxy is one of those few companies with uh, a huge expertise in sinking carbon dioxide into oil and gas fields, existing oil and gas fields. Previously, it did that to extract more oil and gas because you can push out and increase the yield from a depleting well by, by adding that pressure, by right. adding that CO2. Now it thinks if the world can pay it for reducing emissions through direct air capture because we have to undo, not just stop putting out greenhouse gases, but also extract them back from the atmosphere, that it bets the, the world will pay for the service, and we better be a carbon management company because we already know how to do this. We, we can do it at scale. So, I mean, but is it, you know, is she, um, I mean, it's, it's interesting because Occidental, in, in, um, in conceding that, that, you know, um, that their product is contributing to climate change, feels um, considerably ahead of a lot, and, and having and funding these big projects feels considerably ahead of other big um, publicly traded oil and gas companies. But um, I don't. I mean, I don't see other oil and gas companies doing that. Like they, you know, they mainly talk about reducing their oil field emissions. Yeah. So, like you know, I don't know, having renewable energy drive uh, oil field energy as uh, oil field equipment as opposed to diesel or something like that. But um, but they're not talking about reducing the climate impact of their product or shifting to another product entirely. Yeah. And so, you know, so what is her goal? I mean, is it like, is is it just for Oxy to do its thing, or or is there a sense that, you know, that the bigger oil companies, the oil majors, or even national oil and gas companies would would replicate what Ox Occidental is planning to do? To some extent, and I think that might be more marketing than real uh, economics. For her, as I looked at those projects, it's about making profits. Um, the direct air capture plant that she's going to build, which is going to be a half a million tons, uh, you know, on global scale, quite a t tiny amount, but for that particular technology, that is a hundred times bigger than anything that's been built uh, until now. Right. And so it's a big bet for the technology, um, but it's being supported through a huge amount of government, government policy money. and subsidies to make it happen. So she's going to be, if she builds it on time and, and under budget, profitable from the get-go, right? So to be funded, to go after a green technology as pro and profitable from the very start, is uh, is an opportunity that you know presented to an oil company they should take it right but you know I mean you know part of it is is like where we should be placing the bets mm -hmm. on and so direct air capture or this plant you know one of my colleagues uh, visited it and wrote about it recently uh, as as of late last year when this is up and running it is going to um, extract the carbon dioxide that the world puts out over a ten minute period. Yes. You know, it's tiny. It's tiny. It's tiny. Um, I guess the vision is to, that, you know, ultimately to meet our net zero goals, we yep. will have to have hundreds of plants like this. Well, thousands. Um, thousands. I, I mean, mean, sorry. Yeah. No. If you look at yeah. it from, I mean, the numbers are bonkers. Um, so if you just count it in electricity, um, one ton of capturing it, uh, capturing direct air capture uh, emissions from for CO2 is about the equivalent of me and my wife consuming electricity in my London flat for six 
months. Right. Um, and so the, the, the energy economics of direct air capture is quite extreme. But it's supposed to be part of a big set of solutions, right? So only about 5% or maybe 10% at most uh, of uh, greenhouse gas emissions need to be captured using this technology. Everything else needs to be emissions reduction first. Um, and these things do start tiny, right? Solar and wind started off at 0.1%, then maybe 1%, and now they're contributing 10% of electricity mm -hmm. mix. All happened within the past 10 years, 15 years. Um, and so direct air capture needs to get going, but it is not the solution to to climate action. It is a part of a huge portfolio of solutions. Right. So I, I'm seeing questions come in, and I'm sure people in the audience have questions too. If you do have questions, um, and you're in the um, and you're and you're watching this uh, online, please send your questions to askac.org. Um, and we'll get to your questions in a few minutes. And I think um, th there's a whole long discussion about Oxy that, that we could have, but I, it, it gets to the next point, and that is the continued um, um, the continued um, development of fossil fuels. Right. So you know what what scientists and experts say is that the deployment of renewable energy or or you know things like direct air capture or or, or carbon capture and sequestration. All of that is important uh, given you know, how much CO2 and other forms of greenhouse gases we have in the atmosphere. Um, but there actually also has to be a reduction. It just can't be like continuing to deploy renewables while you're also building up um, fossil fuels. So uh, one of my colleagues sent me uh, a tweet that uh, Narendra Modi put out, and it, and it had to do with the fact that um, India had crossed one billion tons in coal and lignite production. Yes. He called it, a, or he, he retweeted that it was a historical milestone for India, reflecting our commitment to ensuring a vibrant coal sector, also ensures India's path towards uh, a self-reliant India, and he called it a remarkable feat. Yep. So I guess the question is, you know, how, um, you know, you write about a lot of different and, and quite exciting changes. Um, the concern, as a lot of people watch this, right, is are these changes happening fast enough? Yes. So they are not. Um, I mean, we should think about it in two ways. One, before the Paris Agreement was signed, the world was on track for four degrees Celsius or more uh, in warming um, uh, beyond pre-industrial levels. Now it's on track to be under three degrees Celsius of warming. That's happened in a decade period, right? We've not even we're not even ten years out from when Paris was first signed in December 2015, um, and so there is progress happening, right? But we live in a two-track world where because we still hit a new record on greenhouse gas emissions, and we continue to put out greenhouse gas emissions even after what might feel like 2023 might be a peak. Now emissions last year just rose by 0.1 percent. Um, uh, which is, you know, almost plateauing. Mm -hmm. um, but as long as we keep putting greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere, yeah. extreme weather is going to get worse, right? It's going to get more extreme. So we have to recognize this, these two-track worlds that we live in, um, and that is hard to compute. Going back to the point of India and coal, I mean, again, place it in the historical context. If you look at the historical emissions that contribute to the climate problem today, the U.S. still remains Absolutely. by far the largest emitter. China, of course, is uh, close to becoming second after the European Union. Uh, but China may never overcome the total amount of greenhouse gas emissions that the, U the U.S. has put out because of the sheer amount that uh, the West has done. So from an Indian perspective, it's about equity, right? Uh, they've asked for a trillion dollars. If you can give them a trillion dollars by 2030, they'll meet all the climate goals you want. None of the Western countries are willing to do that. So what would they do? They care about economic development. They care about uh, reaching a, a level of uh, life that doesn't need to be an American consumerist lifestyle, but at least a European one, which is a third of the carbon footprint today uh, of Americans. And they will go after it in whatever form that they can, which is burn more fossil fuels. But it is upon a global system, both of diplomacy, government, but also uh, an economic system that has to help countries like India to not rely on fossil fuels at that scale. Right, and it's also you know a tricky proposition because we see it not just in India but in in other countries that you know your uh, that Bloomberg's covered that NPR's covered, and that is that countries rely on fossil fuels either for for domestic development or as exports because they say, look, we do not deny that climate change is happening, but this is the only way we can get money to help our people. 
The problem is like the changes that are coming with the climate might hit your people a lot harder, you know, including your contribution of, of greenhouse gases, than you will have the, the funds, you know, to use to protect them, right? So it's it's a it's a very um, it's it's a very naughty issue, and. Um, so uh, I will I will let the rest of you come up with naughty issues for Akshat to uh, to interview. If you do have questions, there's a mic over here if you're in the audience, and so just please line up there. That way we know. But um, I'm going to start with questions here. So um, there's a question here about will going all in on the energy transition, um, in, I guess in the U.S. I'm assuming, seed economic competitiveness to China. I think that's a very common question we get. So what do you what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean it's uh, given what China's done over the past two decades, it's made, it now makes the cheapest of all, most all green technologies that exist, right? Solar, wind, batteries, hydrogen, uh, electric cars. Um, and there is, you know, if you're, if you're looking at purely from an economist perspective, you would say, get the cheapest clean energy wherever you can get it from, that would drive the fastest reduction in emissions globally. The trouble is, good economics doesn't always mean good politics. Uh, mm -hmm. And often, even economic theory can actually um, ignore political, uh, so, uh, ignore economic reality. So let me give you answer in two ways. Mm -hmm. the, the, the first is um, the work of uh, Abhijit Banerjee, an economist who won a Nobel Prize. He's found there's something called a stickiness factor that economists don't consider, which is people don't move as much. You know, we talk about mm -hmm. migration, right. migration being a huge issue, but it's a very marginal number of people who actually put in the effort of moving countries. Um, you know, in an economist's dream, all the software engineers would move to America and all the manufacturers would move to China. Right. And we would make really cheap, good, innovative technology companies here in America and all the manufacturing companies in China. That doesn't happen. People in middle America who've lost out on manufacturing jobs haven't moved to China. They're still living there, just don't have jobs. Mm -hmm. And so uh, economics has to recognize that, that, that there is a fundamental reality of how people operate in the economic system. And so that hits the political lens, which is this is the reason why the Inflation Reduction Act has come, because it is not just about making green technologies cheaper, but it's also about reshoring jobs to America right. to add these domestic uh, content requirements on many of these technologies so that there would be industries created here. And a lot of the money from the Inflation Reduction Act, more than the majority, is going to Republican states, is, going, is. To the, <laughs> is going to middle America, where there's all this land yeah. uh, and all this much cheaper labor, much clearer access to renewables if you would like to build it. Right. I mean, and, and but I think that gets to a really interesting point that, that you know, um, we come across a lot in, in covering um, the, the build out of, of clean tech manufacturing. And there's a question here about that. Does climate capitalism risk exploiting the global south? How mm -hmm. can the global south meaningfully benefit from this transformation? And I'd like to build on that question. Yep. Right, so you know, I think one of the big criticisms of developing oil, like fossil fuels is, is um, exploitation of, of uh, surrounding communities, you know, whether in, uh, in, industrial, in the industrialized world or in developing countries, the pollution that occurs there, so the, the environmental you know, uh, depredations. And um, and so there's there's been a lot of coverage recently about things like lithium, cobalt, and and the um, and the the sort of really difficult discussions that ensue, and 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 the desire not to replicate those yes. patterns. So um, so what are your thoughts about that? Like how how mm -hmm. can we move quickly to green transitions and still protect people in places so we don't replicate bad practices from the past? Yeah. Well, three things to say there. One. The amount of mining that we are going to have to do as part of the energy transition is actually 100 times less than what we mine already. So we mine about 15 billion tons of fossil fuels today. We're going to need about 1 billion tons of all kinds of metals, perhaps, mm -hmm. uh, or less than that, 100 million tons, depending on, on how efficient we get at it. Uh, and so the total amount of mining footprint actually goes down in the energy transition, not up. Mm -hmm. That's one. The second is very much true, though. There will be new places where we, you will have to mine, because many of the energy transition metals, like copper, lithium, cobalt, uh, nickel, manganese, uh, aluminum, are going to be mined in places that don't have mines already. Um, and, and so 
that is something we need to be careful about. And then the third point being, you know, we're talking capitalism here, but we, there is a there's a point in which you can't really separate, given the 200 year history uh, of the Industrial Revolution, colonialism and capitalism, yeah. right? And so <clears throat> we've gone through this period where exploitation was the norm, and that's how the world operated. And now we live in a world where at least more people have the right and the voice uh, that than ever in the past. And so we need to make sure that we don't make the mistakes of the colonial past. Now, I'll give you, there aren't very many examples. There, there right. are a few examples okay. where this is starting to happen, uh, or at least being thought about. So Europe is committed to its transition, committed to moving to electric cars, manufacturing them in Europe. Um, but it requires metals uh, that it doesn't have. Right. And so one place it's working is in South America, where the European Union is working with uh, Chile and a few other countries to try and bring technology for manufacturing electric buses to those regions. So you get manufacturing jobs there, you get technology development on the, in those regions, in return getting access to some of the lithium uh, and copper from those regions. That is perhaps the, the, the clearest way, you know, there's, it's probably impossible to correct the inequities of the past, but let's not try and make the mistakes again in this transition. So I'm sorry, just one follow up to that. Like the, the, the one of the companies you write about is CATL, mm -hmm. the, the big battery maker in China. Uh, they have a big stake in cobalt in Congo. Mm -hmm. And uh, and um, there's there are, you know, books, articles, lots written about mining in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Who does it, uh, the, you know, which is just Regular people working with their hands and some very basic tools, yes. and 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 the or children, sometimes. or children. I mean, yes, children, yes. and and it's and it is, um, uh, and I guess, you know, the EU, the United States, um, the, and and there are certain laws in place to try to to uh, to get companies to to uh, accept a measure of responsibility for their supply chains. What exists, you know, in China, and I mean, they're they're big players, so you can't. I yes. mean, and then you know, and then European and American countries end up with products that have these batteries in them. Yeah, um, what does exist in China is a realization that cobalt is not something that they can use at scale. A because it comes from those regions, but it's also expensive relative mm -hmm. to other metals. And so China, if any country has actually shown you can use non-cobalt chemistries for lithium-ion batteries. China uh, mastered lithium-ion phosphate, which is an iron-based chemistry, so right. much cheaper. Uh, and that is now, uh, now in Tesla. So Tesla, because it wanted a high-performing car, previously had cobalt in its batteries. It still does. Increasingly, because China's made iron chemistry so cheap and so effective, many of its cars shipping around the world have iron chemistry. So in that case, at least in the cobalt case specifically, there are technology alternatives that can be created to try and avoid some of this. But you're right. But, but, it's, but, but there's no human rights problem. laws, no, right? There are, yeah. OK. Well, we have a, a question from the audience. Thank you. Well, and, and good morning, and thank you for having this conversation. Uh, I think it's an important one. You bring up the alignment or the you know, capitalism and colonialism. So the question becomes one of, for 200 years, there hasn't been a cost for all the carbon and other things that we've been putting into the atmosphere. Yes. And what we're seeing is a differentiation between um, what the Inflation Reduction Act, which is, you know, I'll call it the carrot, helping companies turn to be more uh, conscious of what they're doing versus the stick carbon taxes that are being applied in Europe. Do you see a balance? Do uh, you see one versus the other? Where do you see that going? Because as much as we talk about capitalism and what the companies are doing, it's the governments that are really going to have to steer this to get the, bal to get the balance back to if we're going to move forward. Yeah, very good question. Um, you're right. Uh, you know, Lord Nicholas Stern, whose report uh, really shaped how we think about the economics of climate change over the past 20 years now, came out in 2005, called climate change the greatest market failure that there has ever been. Um, and one way in which uh, you could address that is put a global carbon price, and you'll get people moving away uh, from polluting industries to cleaner industries, because we have been allowing corporations to pollute for free for all this time. Now that we understand the costs that it uh, causes to people because of climate impacts, we should start to price that in. The difficulty is, again, you know, going back to the theme that we talked about, 
political reality and economics don't always go hand in hand. Um, so the European Union is a good example. They started in 2005-ish uh, with a carbon price and slowly ramped it up uh, you know, because of the financial crisis. They got it wrong and it was very low mm -hmm. for a long time, but have over the past five to seven years really ramped it up and it's making a difference. Um, but the other example is uh, your northern neighbor, Canada. Uh, Canada has a carbon price and Justin Trudeau um, for you know all the the difficulties of still sticking to a, a fossil fuel economy, Canada produces a lot of oil. Mm -hmm. At least has brought in a carbon price, and it's a carbon price that ramps up pretty quickly, going out to 2030. Now they've done it much more differently than the Europeans have, which is it's not just a cost to the companies, and then governments take that money and do what they want with it. He's actually doing something called a fee and dividend. He collects all that all that. Uh, um, money that comes from pricing pollution, and he gives it back to people. It, they actually get checks every six months with hundreds of dollars uh, in many cases. That is making at least um, the most recent study I saw, eight out of 10 families get more rebates in the form of, uh, of carbon fee, uh, of carbon dividends than the increased prices they pay on fossil fuels or, or on goods. And yet, the politics there is very divided. The conservatives there, uh, hate the carbon uh, pricing policy, and because people don't always act economically rationally, but they act in their political groups, yeah. there is a big pushback on, on carbon pricing. So it's not a silver bullet solution. It can work, as European Union is showing, um, but it will work in, in the political context that it is. One last thing to add is that what European Union is doing is actually pushing other countries to start to think about a carbon price too. So the European Union now has something called a carbon border adjustment mechanism, or just think about it as a tariff, a carbon tariff. So if you were to export from 2026 um, your goods into uh, Europe, uh, and they are carbon intensive goods, then you have to match the carbon quantity of emissions on those goods that a European company would be uh, producing. If you can't, then you have to pay a price, and that's forcing countries like China to actually build out a carbon market. It has one already. Uh, India announced that it's going to have a carbon market as of December 2023. It's starting to put rules in place. And so you can get an outward going policy uh, as well, but it is not a silver bullet solution. And, ju and just to add to that, um, this is one of the few um, areas where there's bipartisan support in Congress. You have Republican and Democratic members of Congress working on bills to have a border tax in the United States, because mainly because they think it, it's it's not about so much about acceptance of climate change, but a, a sense that it would disadvantage Chinese imports to the United States uh, if if they actually had to account for or, or price in their their carbon pollution. Anyway, we have another question from the audience. Go ahead. Uh, sure. Thank you so much. Um, fascinating conversation so far. So I'm going to ask a question that's a bit against the grain um, of the discussion here in Washington at the moment. Um, a lot of the discussion of the cooperation between the U.S. and China focuses essentially on the diplomatic relationship and um, how they can potentially cooperate in that G2 relationship on climate. But my question is actually, do you think it's possible to achieve an optimal net zero trajectory? Can we meet net zero by 2050 um, without the U.S. and Chinese economies being open to each other for the sake of discussion? So like, for instance, um, there was a massive backlash against CATL and Ford partnering, uh, right, um, I think it was about a year ago, a bit over a year ago. Um, but a lot of the reason why China is so competitive in manufacturing these days isn't because of low labor costs, because they have better technology in manufacturing. So um, is it possible for the U.S. and China to ring fence each other's economies and for us to proceed on the optimal pathway to net zero? Thank you. Yeah, uh, very good question. I, as a reporter, I'm not in the job of making projections or predictions, so I don't know. But what I can say is that um, you know, there are two parts of it. One, that there needs to be diplomatic uh, relationships between the US and China to actually make things happen. It may not be uh, diplomatic relations that also allow for open trade, but at least diplomatic relations on setting targets. So what we've seen over the past decade, especially uh, you know, starting from uh, the Obama White House, is that when the US and China are talking at a global diplomacy level for climate, the rest of the world actually 
is much closer to getting agreements done. That was true under the Paris Agreement. That was true in the Glasgow COP in, uh, in uh, uh, 2021. It was true in the Dubai COP last year. The US and China diplomatically agreeing on setting targets globally, well, for their own countries first, and then uh, uh, allowing those to be set globally, is crucial for climate progress to happen. Now, that has also happened in a period where trade relationships have frayed under Trump, as well as they've not gotten much better under Biden. Um, and given where the geopolitics stands, it doesn't look like it's going to get better. Um, but it's again going back to some of the things we talked about economics. It may mean that this may not be the cheapest energy transition you could get to net zero, mm -hmm. but it may be the most politically feasible one where if America wants its industries and is going to back industrial policy, then it needs to adjust to a carbon border adjustment mechanism so that it can ensure that its domestic industry actually benefits from those uh, emissions reductions and is not eaten up by you know, cheaper but also more carbon intensive uh, Chinese goods. Now, we do think about these two economies. They are the largest economies. They are the largest emitters. Still, that is less than 50% of global emissions. The rest of the, <laughs> the world also needs to catch up. And if the US wants to build up its own industry because it can afford to for clean energy, the rest of the world can benefit from cheap Chinese uh, clean energy. Uh, and they are, right? Uh, most solar panels all around the world are mm -hmm. still built by Chinese, solar by Chinese manufacturers. Uh, providing those solar panels. Increasingly, that's starting to happen in electric cars. China now is the largest exporter of cars, more than Germany, more than Japan. Yeah, yeah. Is it that the electric car BYD? Is it, that it? So BYD is now the largest maker of electric I cars. See. Uh, in the exports, it's a mix. They, they also export fossil fuels. They just cars. have cooler names than BYD. <laughs> <laughs> they do have a lot of cooler names. There's a <laughs> yeah. company called Neo, yeah. uh, Xiaopang. Mm. <laughs> cool names. Cool names. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, there, we have a question online. Uh, they said, you know, uh, the the questioner is asking for a bit of discussion about ESG investing, and you know, what do we make of the future role of ESG focused business decisions? And in part of the context is we also hear a lot of back and forth about this. That like, you know, there are. Um, BlackRock and others might be pulling back a little bit. There's also uh, a kind of threats of money, of, of, of some kind of punishment for following ESG from Republican-led states, uh, Texas being the leader in that. So what do you, I mean, I, you, you don't really write about ESG, I don't think, in the book, my recollection, yes. but, but, but what, you know, but you do work at Bloomberg. So, so the question is, like, like, what is the role of ESG right now yeah. in pushing innovation and emissions reductions and you know is it is it a real thing even yeah. i think that's like a layperson's question it's like is this real yeah um people who pick up this book and think climate capitalism is about carbon markets and esg are likely to be disappointed because yeah. none of those are there in the book and the reason for them not being there in the book is they are not success stories yet the the sort of filter i applied to the book was try to find success stories for climate solutions working at scale carbon markets voluntary ones aren't working at scale uh, and uh, ESG isn't working at scale. So now we could spend an entire hour just talking about ESG, but let me give some brief context. So ESG is environmental social governance. These are just basically factors that investors may take on board in making investment decisions beyond the financial metrics. So not just the profits that the company is making or the revenue they are generating, uh, but also whether they are reducing their emissions, whether they have uh, equity, gender equity in pay, uh, et cetera, et cetera. These factors have been shown in, in many cases to actually benefit a company in the long term in their profitability. That was the case that was made for ESG investing. Going back from the 80s onwards, it wasn't called ESG then, um, it was impact investing or, or uh, corporate social uh, responsibility, mm -hmm. all those different terms that have evolved since then. Um, what has happened now is a bit of a muddling. Uh, so on the financial side, ESG metrics are measured at very different levels. And there, there are no standards, there are very few regulations. Only The only region really bringing in reg regulations on ESG is the European Union. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the US uh, tried to do that with the SEC putting out rules on scope one and two emissions, the sort of bare minimum that you would require on environmental metrics. And now that's got, got into a court and yep. is on, on, on hold. Um, so you need a lot more clarity 
on what ESG metrics are and so that you can make actual real proper informed decisions right. on investing. That's one side of muddling. Then there's a second side of muddling that's happening on the political side that I am still confused about, uh, which is about around woke politics, around exclusion uh, of fossil fuel companies. Right. Uh, now, if you look at investment theory, the entire game is that you as an investor are supposed to you know, be paid all that top dollar to make smart decisions about what the future is likely to bring in better investment returns. Right. And what both politicians are saying, no, 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 invest in everything, including fossil fuels, don't make decisions for us. So I'm not sure what the political side is, but it's just right now ESG is in a mess of all these. Yeah, that's because you don't live in America, believe me. <laughs> um, so, um, but that does get to something really interesting. Um, you know, we, we have a, a consequential election coming up in November. Um, uh, Donald Trump, who's the presumptive uh, Republican nominee, has called Biden's, um, you know, green policies and the investment uh, in the uh, Inflation Reduction Act a scam. So what do you, given, given the work that you've already done about the changes taking place in the private sector, um, if... Um, if, President Trump, if former President Trump is elected uh, again and, um, and has a, a, um, a Congress that, that goes along with his views, um, what kind of uh, impact could that have yeah. on, on what is happening in the U.S., but globally as far as uh, the private sector answering the call of, of climate change? Or do you think those things will, will continue at the same pace regardless? Um, no, I mean, the, the likelihood of them continuing at the same pace if uh, a Republican president comes in place are likely very low. Now, um, the best analysis I found on this um, recently was from Carbon Brief that looked at numbers. Uh, if Donald Trump is elected as president, what kind of impact does that have on greenhouse gas emissions? And uh, they found that basically emissions this decade could be four billion tons higher than uh, they would be otherwise, which is a huge number uh, in one one way because uh, you know any amount of additional greenhouse gas emissions at this point is a bad thing, uh, and if it's in billions of tons, it's a very bad thing. Uh, but it's also you know relative to the global count of emissions we are putting up uh, putting out about 35 to 38 billion tons every year. You know it's a small number that way, um, but to me the the clearest answer to this uh, problem came from Tom Steyer, you know, former mm -hmm. Democratic presidential nominee who I'd, I had on my podcast Zero, and he said, look, Inflation Reduction Act, it looks like the Republican states are gaining more, and who doesn't want free money? Right. And so that's likely to stay in some form or not. You know, we have understood people do economically irrational things, but how economically irrational you can be, probably not as much. And so you, that might stick around and you might still get uh, um, a number of green policies continuing. The biggest impact he thinks is that it'll have a, uh, uh, an impact on global diplomacy, right? So if uh, Donald Trump, like last time, pulled the US out of the Paris Agreement. Right, and passed uh, laws that make it harder for the US to return to it. Right, right. Uh, that could mean uh, you know you don't have the, the uh, question uh, from the audience about the G1, G2 uh, dis decision between US and China to actually have right. agreement on climate. That could slow down global climate uh, uh, target yeah. setting. That, to me, is, is the biggest risk. Now, will private industry continue at the same pace? Probably not in America, but the rest of the world, quite likely, right? right. So you have China already ahead. Right. India is starting to do industrial policy on its own. Europe is doing its own industrial policy. Africa is not sitting around with all these access to minerals that are being exploited. It wants to be our part of the transition. Same thing's happening with South America. And so, you know, those regions will probably get up and go on with the transition, maybe not at the same pace, but they're not going to slow down particularly as much as the U.S. will with a Republican president. Okay. So um, there's time for one more question. And, I'm, and in, so one thing that we see in the United States and, and, and overseas, too, but I feel like we see it more in the United States are certain barriers to the deployment of clean energy. Um, EVs are becoming a... Um, a flashpoint in the election where um, 
um, the Republican messaging is that, you know, it'll uh, basically, you know, they, they are unaffordable, they'll lead to ruin, tanks are going to become electrified and we'll lose our war fighting advantage. But then you also see in the grassroots level things like um, like a lot of misinformation that, that local people pick up about what solar and wind could do to their communities, their property values and all of that. And I'm just wondering like, you know, what kind of pushback yeah. you see on, you know, like, you know, companies can want to do things, but if like, yeah. you know, it, they're not zoned for it and projects are turned down, that, that uh, does not get deployed, right? So what kind of pushback are you seeing, especially, you know, in the United States? And is it and is the U U.S. an outlier as far as the the impact that misinformation does have on communities? Or are we seeing this worldwide? No, um, it is not an outlier. It's not as widespread as you would think. So, you know, we had climate denialism slow down things. Now there is uh, a form of climate delayism. You take the solution and you say, oh, no, it's not going to quite work. No, it's actually it's quite dirty. Um, <laughs> So that's starting to happen. I mean, in Germany, heat pumps are the, the electric car, uh -huh. uh, where they're like, oh, it's never going to work at cold temperatures. Anyway, it consumes too much electricity. That's coming from a coal power, power plant anyway, all of which is misinformation. Uh, you know, heat pumps are a very good clean energy solution uh, or emissions reduction solution. Um, but so it is still marginal. Uh, just like climate de de uh, denialism was always marginal. It was just small voices that were very loud right. uh, that slowed things down. So now, two ways to think about this. One, I would make a pitch for our profession that journalism is as, you know, more crucial than ever to, to survive if you want to have good information. And the business model of journalism right now is in dire straits. Right. And so um, you know, that's something up to society to try and figure out journalism is actually providing a service that they need more than ever. Uh, but the, the second side of it is, you know, if there is a global problem that has seen this before, it's climate change, right? Uh, climate denialism in the 90s was a pretty organized campaign mm -hmm. to try and sow doubt and slow down policies, and it worked. And yet you today have a Paris Agreement and you have all these technologies and industries and companies that are realizing that there are no profits to be made on a, on a planet on fire and that you need <laughs> to figure out a solution to uh, this problem. And so f the, the physics and chemistry of climate change is going to force our hands right. uh, to actually work on these solutions because otherwise there is ruin and we know where that lies. Right, and it, and it kind of gets to the question of things being deployed too slowly, like what are the things that slow it down? Um, I uh, wanted to thank all of you online and in person for joining us today. Um, one of the things that Akshat says in his book is that the, the, the race to develop these technologies um, and, and um, the fact that people want to invest in this shows that there is a, a belief that the science still supports that we are not too late to affect the rise of greenhouse gas emissions and also for our societies to adapt. And, uh, and you point out that major energy transitions have taken place in the past, right, and, and, and including in our lifetimes. So, you know, the, the question then becomes, how are these things working together, um, technology, people, and policy, to bring about the changes fast enough to keep us and also people who have less advantages, than, fewer advantages than us, safe um, and prosperous um, going forward. So thank you, Akshat. Thank you all for joining today. Thank you. Thank you, Nila, and thank you.